Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, I'm delighted to see you all here for this <coughs> Artists Roundtable for our production of Mary Queen of Scots, otherwise known in the opera biz as Maria Stuarda. Uh, we are do indeed doing it in Italian. Uh, I'd like to introduce the panel uh, who are here with us today. First of all, uh, immediately to my right, our Maria, who was here last season as Lucia in Lucia di Lammermoor, soprano Angela Gilbert. And next to her, her arch rival, Elizabeth the Queen, our mezzo-soprano, Kate Aldrich. And in the romantic role, the, our romantic lead, uh, uh, the Earl of Leicester, our tenor, Yegesha Manucharyan. Our bass, who sings the role of Talbot, who hasn't been here since Tannhäuser, <laughs> so directly from the Wartburg, Reinhard Hagen. <laughs> and of course, it is my personal delight and uh, all of us here at San Diego to welcome back a dear friend, uh, the conductor Eduardo Müller. <laughs> And another returnee, a dear friend, uh, the stage director, Andrew Sinclair. Now, I don't normally start things this way, but I really would like to begin with a very short reading, not from the scripture, but, <laughs> but from the book, The Bel Canto Operas by our friend Charles Osborne. And this deals directly with the first production of Maria Stuarda, in which Donizetti, of course, was involved. <laughs> and the paragraph begins, unfortunately, <laughs> after a successful dress rehearsal, the opera was banned by order of the king, perhaps because his queen, Maria Christina, was a direct descendant of Mary Stuart. News may have reached the court of the opera's famous scene of confrontation between Mary and Elizabeth, in which Mary calls the English queen a vile bastard, vil bastarda. At the first orchestra rehearsal, the soprano, Giuseppina Ronzi de Benis, playing Maria, delivered this line with such conviction that the Elizabeth, Anna del Sere, attacked her physically <laughs> tearing her hair and beating her with her fists. Oh. <laughs> Ronzi di Benis retaliated so ably that Anna del Sere fainted and had to be carried home. <laughs> so girls, <laughs> how is the confrontation scene? Maybe we should go in between, huh? <laughs> Perhaps we'll begin with Angela. Can I sit between them? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Um, well, uh, you kind of put me on the spot now. Um, well, we use our words as weapons, and uh, we were having a bet before uh, who the first person would be uh, to ask us whether we slapped one another. We didn't think it would be you. <laughs> um, Sorry. <laughs> um, yeah, we use our words as weapons, um, because those really are their only weapons, them being females, despite you know what happened that night. Um, and we try and make it as electric as possible, just based on what she says, I mean, after everything that's happened and um, Mary's constant supplication to Elizabeth, please help me, I need your help, you're my cousin, this whole experience, um, you know, Elizabeth answers by imprisoning her for 19 years. Mm. And I think, um, yeah, I think she's justified in what she <laughs> says. <laughs> really? <laughs> Um, I think for Elizabeth, it's a really uh, difficult thing to hear because all of the time before she became queen, she was followed by this issue of whether or not she was um, illegitimate, whether or not she was a, a bastard child, um, more than the issue of, of uh, Protestant and Catholic at that time, that was the biggest issue for her. Um, so when she became queen, obviously that wasn't brought up as much. So just hearing that from the woman that she despises more than anyone else. I mean, it's just, it, it couldn't get any worse. And in addition, mm -hmm. she has stolen my man. <laughs> <laughs> I'd like to turn it over just for a moment then to um, 
uh, Andrew Sinclair, uh, given the fact that this meeting never really happened, <laughs> or at least we have no evidence that it happened, and I think most scholars agree that it just did not, they never met right. in real life. Does that pose any difficulties at all? Uh, no, it doesn't actually. I think it's, uh, it's, it's an, um, an invention of Mr. O'Hare Schiller, um, who wrote the play. And while there's a lot of objection uh, to this, I know a lot of people who say, well, we won't go and see Maria Stuarda, or if Mary Stewart, the play is on, well, we won't go and see that, because we just can't face the fact that, you know, that this happened on stage, this happens on stage, and it didn't happen historically. Um, personally, I find it's pretty good theatre, and if dramatic license is to be taken, I'm certainly happy for that. I think there are other areas um, in the opera which are less successful and do provide problems, but this is certainly not one of them. Mm -hmm. I find it interesting, too, speaking of the libretto, that the librettist only wrote one libretto, and it was this one. And he was 17 years old. We never hear of him again. He returns to Naples as the prefect of police in his later life which I find an interesting <coughs> change in career. Um, but is, is it a, in terms of libretti from this period, do you feel that it's weak or normal or? Is no, I don't, I don't, certainly don't feel it's weak. Um, in rehearsal, I mean, it, it, it's very good that, that we've actually had time enough to be able to talk about uh, the characters and talk about the libretto and, and what the subtext is here and there. Um, <clears throat> there are certain things, uh, for instance, in the opening scene with, with Kate in the court, in Elizabeth's court, you know, where all the chorus sing, you know, mercy for Mary Stuart. <laughs> so she and, 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 and she's the only one who clearly um, is against Mary. Uh, and you have to find a way to play that. Also, um, it's rather opera plot in so far as... Um, Mary and Lester are in love um, in the opera, and there's, a, there's an extended and very beautiful duet um, in Act Two for them. But the, of course, this historically was not the case. And uh, so we have to try and, we have to play it because that's what's in the libretto, that's what's in the opera. But you know, um, we have to find ways around it. And I was very interested that Angela felt the same way when we came to rehearse. Mm -hmm. um. I'd, I'd like to, we, we probably should have begun, but I just couldn't, I, I, I couldn't let the opportunity go by to tell you that story. But uh, I, let's back up a little bit and talk about bel canto, because this is, is of course, a bel canto, a so-called bel canto opera. Uh, and I think just for our audience, because we don't hear bel canto operas that often, although we did get one last year, um, what bel canto is, I'd like to turn to our conductor, Maestro Mueller, just talk a little bit about that concept. How long can we stay here? <laughs> <laughs> Three <laughs> minutes. <laughs> but what is it, what does it mean, and what does it mean in terms of this particular opera? This particular opera, first of all, hello, I'm so happy to be with you again, and, uh, and uh, <laughs> it will be... It will be so difficult uh, after the tremendous success uh, of Tannhäuser uh, to compete uh, with this production. But we are a good team uh, and we hope we will do a good job. Uh, and uh, the fact that uh, Tannhäuser is a masterpiece uh, doesn't mean uh, that Maria Stuart is not uh, a, another masterpiece. If uh, Delacroix is a great pa painter, it uh, doesn't mean that Raffaello is not a great painter. So you will hear a completely different uh, uh, opera. By the way, I see the season, it's uh, extremely interesting because you can, can touch uh, from Wagner to Belcanto to, to Verismo to Verdi to, mm -hmm. to French. It's a, an extraordinary season. And we will try to do our best with this piece. Belcanto. Belcanto doesn't mean uh, that it is not a drama. Everybody says, oh, Belcanto is beautiful singing. Of course it is beautiful singing, but beautiful singing must be also in, in Tannhäuser, also in Cavalleria and uh, in Aida. But uh, don't forget that it is a romantic drama. I consider this piece the, like, uh, like Lucia, for example, that has been written one year after. This is a kind of dress rehearsal of Lucia. The, f remember that this is the symbol of what... Uh, romantic opera is. 
And the fact uh, that we emphasize uh, the expression from the vocal point of view doesn't mean that this is just uh, beautiful sounds. It's extremely intense. Romantic uh, theater is based, uh, all the romanticism is based uh, on uh, three main factors, on love, on honor, and on death. You will find uh, all of this in this opera. But you will find uh, it so well uh, presented with such uh, an architecture uh, of the piece uh, that we really can say this is uh, a not uh, enough known uh, masterpiece. Even in Italy, in uh, Europe, uh, this piece is not frequently performed. Why? One of the reasons is, of course, uh, that uh, it is so difficult to find uh, three and more than three, but especially three extremely good singers that can uh, afford this kind of, uh, of, uh, of coloraturas, uh, of, tes uh, of tesitura. Then uh, sometimes uh, we are a little li lazy. Oh, we like uh, uh, Lucia, uh, and uh, we prefer to go to Lucia than Maria Stuarda. No, if you like Lucia, you will like uh, even Maria Stuarda. What are the values? Uh, I will tell you of Maria Stuarda. One is, uh, as I already told you, is the architecture. Theatrically, I find it uh, a masterpiece. I don't know if you agree, but uh, it's so well developed to the, to the end. Then uh, the vocal line, uh, the vocality is uh, a kind uh, of uh, summa of the best uh, you can find uh, in this repertoire. The melody, the melodic lines uh, are so beautiful that it is too easy sometimes to forget uh, the drama and you shut your eyes uh, and, uh, and you listen to the music uh, and you almost cry. It's extremely beautiful. And uh, the great concertati. The instrumentation, they said many times, oh, Donizetti is not a great uh, instrument. Uh, is not uh, able to use great instrumentation. You could not uh, use a different instrumentation for this kind of music that uh, emphasizes uh, the vocality and uh, does not cover, I hope I will not cover, uh, the, the singers. It's uh, extremely important. Another of the Donizetti values is that he anticipated uh, Verdi. You will hear many pages uh, that uh, Verdi not copied, but assimilated. And I can say that without Donizetti, without this Donizetti, we would not have had Verdi. And then there are many others that you will discover the moment you will come and listen to this. Then I have something else to tell, but probably I'm talking, as always, too much. <laughs> no, 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 no. Never enough. Never enough. <laughs> Uh, Reinhardt, you're just coming from Tannhäuser, our production of Tannhäuser. Now, Wagner always spoke about wanting bel canto singers in his operas. Uh, maybe I have two questions for you. Number one, is it true? <laughs> Number two, uh, do you find you have to make any adjustment from singing the heavy German literature and then coming into Donizetti? Well, I would uh, like to start with the second question. Of course, it's much easier for me to sing in German language because I am German, so <laughs> that's... Uh, um, the bel canto, of course, Wagner, uh, that needs also uh, to being bel canto. And um, I have been at the last round table as well, but I joined the audience, and it was sometimes very funny to hear the answers of my colleagues, and I was sitting there, and I had a friend with me, and, and this friend said, I don't know which was more funny, the comments from the colleagues on stage or your comments beside <laughs> me. <laughs> and and uh, I heard, for instance, some very nice sentences like, you need a very special voice for singing Wagner. Um, well, maybe, but I would say no. Because uh, I used to say, as long as you can sing Wagner, Donizetti, Rossini, Bach, your voice and your, your uh, technique is healthy. Mm -hmm. If you're not able to do that anymore, well, 
maybe I had a big discussion with my friend, good friend Robert Gamble, and uh, who said I cannot sing Bach anymore. That doesn't mean that I have a bad, te bad technique. That's right. Uh, he's a specialist of uh, Wagner opera, and uh, it might be different for the Helden tenors. But in general, I would say it's always the best thing to uh, try to sing bel canto. So it is true that uh, their uh, Wagner and Donizetti is bel canto, both. So. In other words, you're not making an adjustment, really. You're just singing with good technique, whatever I will, you sing. Uh, yeah, I try my very best. Of course, um, there's another problem, since um, none of us has uh, sung this role before, uh, this opera before, and, and for me, especially since Italian is... Uh, I know a little bit Italian, but it's uh, a language which I, which I don't um, speak naturally. Um, it's a little bit difficult to keep all those things, the, the, the meanings, the exact meanings and, and in, the, in the mind and to, to put it into the voice and uh, to bring the character on the stage. So that's of course much more difficult than singing uh, Wagner, which I first of all did before uh, the, the Landgraf in Tannhäuser, and uh, the second, uh, my own language. So it is um, a little bit more difficult to singing this role, especially for me. Mm -hmm. Uh, Yegisha, I'd like to turn to our, our tenor. It's, it's interesting, the Donizetti tenor, and I think there is a Donizetti <coughs> tenor, but there's Nemorino on one end, and there's Edgardo <laughs> on another end, um, and of course he was writing for special singers. What are the, what are the challenges of the role of Lester for, for you, and, and how do you approach it? Uh, I think it's, it's not only for me. The, the role is very high, and sits all in passages. It's, it's for lyric tenor, but it's big singing, and I mean, you must have also that dramatism to, to sing uh, forte sometimes in that, refer in that isitura, which is very difficult. And uh, it's you singing all the time on stage. It's like I have a duet and aria, and then right after that, another duet with um, uh, Elizabeth, which is long and high, which is making uh, tired, as Maestro said you must have very good technique to sing this role. But music is so beautiful, and I'm so happy I'm doing this, and it's very healthy singing because it's bel canto. And another good thing, I'm rounded with lovely ladies. <laughs> 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 what is gorgeous music? I think, uh, uh, I, I find it difficult to understand why this opera is not done more often, because some of the tunes, some of the music certainly that Lester has, but uh, some of the, the music that you ladies have is just gorgeous. I was telling you the other day, I can't get past O Nube, which is, of course, uh, your cavatina at the beginning of the second act, which is just one of the most luscious melodies. It must be very grateful to sing I music think all, like that. All opera it? is beautiful from beginning until end. It's, so, it's beautiful, it's gorgeous music, all opera. Yeah. And probably it's not done very often because of uh, it's very difficult to find uh, that singers, yeah. I think. Um, then it's just dawning we, on me. Are we all debut artists with Maria Stuarder? Have, have you directed it, Andrew? I, have, I haven't directed <coughs> it, but I worked on it, um, <coughs> let's just say, many years ago um, <laughs> as a stage manager in, uh, in England as, uh, on a very fine production by John Copley at the English National Opera, which then actually went to Covent Garden. So I've, um, I've had an association with it. The, the, the edition we're using is, is slightly different here, but I, uh, I know Maria Stuarda yeah, from a, a while back. <laughs> and Eduardo, have you, have you conducted it? Actually, I, I never conducted it, but I prepared for other conductors, which were uh, Mogliano Pradelli and uh, Nino Sanzonio in Firenze. was uh, an extraordinary edition with Leila Genser, uh, with Shirley Derret, oh. uh, oh. Franco Tagliavini, it was fantastic. I have a little funny episode about this production. We prepared it in Firenze, in Maggio Musicale Fiorentino, and it was a huge success. So, the next year we went to Edinburgh to do the same production, but because Molinari Pradelli was busy, the conductor changed, and Nino Sanzonio entered. So, the tempi changed. When the conductor changes, um, a lot of things uh, change, usually. <laughs> <laughs> the soprano, Leila Genser, in the rehearsal, asked the conductor, 
please, maestro, you know, this phrase, uh, I would like to do a little, I don't remember if it was a little slower, a little faster. Uh, could I do it uh, a little slower? And the conductor answered, of course you will do it, of course, with another conductor, but you will do it. <laughs> <laughs> history, that's <is> history. <laughs> Um, I want to get back to Onube because I do want to ask you about this. It's such a gorgeous piece. Um, is it as, uh, as as terrific an experience to sing that aria as it is for people to listen to it? No. <laughs> um, no, it's just extremely difficult as an entrance aria. Um, it is. Yeah, because um, usually when you come on stage, you sort of just want to establish yourself and sing really loudly for about three or four minutes just so you can say okay my voice is working i'm working everything's okay and that aria is not about that at all but you have a recitative yeah but you can't just scream it can you you know <laughs> i'd like to <coughs> it depends but, uh, on who you are i suppose <laughs> well i think who she is is what's important there yeah. and um she's experiencing this incredible like transcendental moment she's been cooped up inside for so long uh, andrew explained it quite well to me, he said uh, he'd been sick once for a very long time and been inside this hospital ward for six months <coughs> and he, could, he finally went outside and the feeling of fresh air and light and everything was, you know, such a moving experience. And I think she feels the same and, you know, as, as I can say, you, you can't, um, you don't shout that to the, no. the hilltops, you know, it's, um, I think it m must have been an, an extraordinary experience and I think it's a bit more intimate than the standard opening aria. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And Elizabeth, I find it, 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 you know, we're surrounded by cinematic uh, and television performances of great actresses who are doing Elizabeth mm -hmm. over and over again. Uh, in fact, one of our uh, Academy Award nominees, of course, is up for the role of Elizabeth. Um, it's easy to, I think, or easier to project her personality and her character with close-ups. You have to do it on stage. Uh, and, and Elizabeth was such a strong personality mm -hmm. and such an individual. Um, how, do you, how do you approach her as an actress? Um, I think a lot of <coughs> who she is is described in the music. I mean, it's so uh, dramatically written. Everything she says is for a reason. and the way in which she says it is always for a very strong reason. Everything she says is incredibly strong. So what, uh, obviously, as you said, we can't do a lot of close-ups, cinematic close-ups. We're trying to keep, or at least I think, I, I feel that we both are very comfortable with the idea of making this more um, theater-like, uh, more realistic, and, and maybe less of, you know, a lot of operatic gestures and something a little um, bit in between operatic and theatrical. And, and I think what we've found that is, is working well for that is by the music is expressing this intense power that she has um, and her royalness. And, and, but her kind of containing all of that power in her physical gesture is kind of our way of, um, of adding to that effect. Mm -hmm. And don't forget that in a theater, in, even in a big theater, the, a small gesture <laughs> really can read. If it's done in the right way, if it's done in the right moment, if the music is also helping um, punctuate that and with the right lighting. So, mm -hmm. um, you know, and I really trust a lot of what Andrew has been, uh, everything Andrew has been saying. So I feel really comfortable with um, the direction we're going. So. Good. Can I just add to that, Nick, please? Um, you know, what we we're trying to do, I mean, Elizabeth is often portrayed very much, uh, um, w well, it's w slightly one dimensional, um, and she's often vilified. Um, what we're trying to do is, is, is to make her three-dimensional, not just to play Elizabeth the Queen, but to play Elizabeth the Woman. And actually both Mary and Elizabeth, of course, were anointed queens who came to the thrones by, by right, although um, Mary disputes that in Elizabeth's case. Um, but they were women in a predominantly male world. And so the feeling of isolation at times for both of them uh, is, is quite extraordinary. 
and uh, the vulnerability that Elizabeth has, where we're also trying to play that so that we make her a complete character. Well, now their relationship historically was very complicated. It wasn't, at least the reading of the, of, of the, of the libretto, it seems much simpler. Do you, do you try to overlay the libretto with, with a, a more complicated relationship between the two ladies to reflect that history, or do you just throw the history out? It, 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 is it not useful as a dramatic tool? I think history is very useful as a dramatic tool. Uh, you can't actually say this is the way history was, so that's what we're going to play, because what you have is the libretto, and that's what you have to play. But we have to take from history what is useful. And, you know, building a character, I mean, both Angela and Kate in these roles have clearly researched it very well. And it's, look, it's a matter, of, it, it, it depends who you read, uh, actually, about what you feel about Mary and Elizabeth. You know, who was right and who was wrong. I did read one uh, writer who said that basically both women were a victim of circumstances at the time. And I actually think that's quite, quite good. Um, we, we do try and play history um, in this production uh, with, with, within the confines. Um, if you play a, just a romantic opera, um, I don't think you're actually using this piece uh, to the full. I mean, Donat said he was an extremely dramatic composer. As, as Maestro said, you know, bel canto is not just about beautiful singing, it's, it's, it's drama. And I think you sell the piece short if you don't really go for the jugular um, mm. with this piece. Uh, and so, yes, we, we, we do, and we, we tend to play it not just as a romantic opera, but as a political, a drama of political intrigue. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. We are talking, sorry, <laughs> we are talking so much about bel canto, and I know that I didn't answer before. <laughs> <I just thought. laughs> Historically, there are two bel cantos area. One is before Rossini, all the famous uh, Porpora, Leo, all these composers that wrote uh, a lot of coloratura. Coloratura means uh, to, to be able to, to, to sing very fast, very great uh, uh, intervals. Uh, and this uh, is mainly to show off uh, how good a singer is, technically, vocally. And then there is a bel canto that started with uh, Rossini, especially the, the late Rossini, and continued with Donizetti, that uh, focused much more uh, on uh, the, the feelings uh, of uh, the characters, uh, without uh, forgetting that they must uh, express these feelings uh, with the best uh, Vo vocality they possess. And this is my task here, the task of the conductor, to be able to take from them the best they can give. But this doesn't mean that I want just uh, singing uh, beautifully. Uh, music can be done in many ways. In Milano now, in La Scala, they are doing the same opera. They are doing Maria Stuarda. And I saw it. I liked it. was a, a fantastic uh, visually and musically production. But I felt, uh, because of the characteristic of the singers, uh, they, they focused more than what I have loved uh, on the bel canto way. For example, the soprano, fantastic, a, a huge triumph, Mariella Di Via, a, a friend of mine, she is uh, a fantastic light soprano. But because uh, her forte is uh, the, the, the coloratura, how fast, uh, and the beautiful top, uh, and she, her, her forte is not in the top notes, uh, in the low notes, uh, and in this uh, opera there are a lot uh, of low notes, uh, mm. she changed uh, almost 30% of the notes that are written in the score. Mm. I'm so grateful to the singers uh, that we are just making a few adjustments uh, that I is, are historically required, uh, even by the composer, a little changes. But we are presenting more or less uh, what Donizetti wanted. 
and uh, write, singing what Donizetti wrote will uh, express much more the feelings of the characters that are in this opera, I think. My task is not to be a philologist, to, to, to see just the, 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 here there is a dot, the world must be a little longer, but is to project an emotion through the voices of my singers. I will sing with their voices. It, is it true that most of the adjustments are in the role of Elizabeth, or are there adjustments in, in, in both? I mean, it, my, my, my understanding is that this was written for two sopranos, but casting usually goes a mezzo and a soprano, and that, that there, there need to be adjustments in, in both roles, or? I think um, by adjustments he was meaning interpolations of, uh, you know, bel canto. We we never really sing only what's written in the, in, in the score because um, people added cadenzas and things like that. Um, mm -hmm. So obviously we've added some cadenzas, but the interesting thing about the roles, is, and specifically Mary in this way, is that when she's at the most emotional she can be. She, not like most sopranos, we sing higher when we're at the most emotional we can be. She sings lower. She uses her chest voice, which is a really unusual <coughs> um, tool in bel canto opera. I don't so know it's quite different from Lucia that you sang last year. It's um, different as night and day. I mean, they might both be from one composer, but wow. Yeah. I mean, you wouldn't recognize it to sing both. Uh. Kate, would you like to, to, to weigh in on that? Um, Elizabeth, uh, there are some moments for interpolations, for um, ornamentation of some of the lines. Uh, for the most part, I don't think that there's so much in Elizabeth that, uh, in terms of ornamentation. Mm -hmm. I think it's more just in the decisions of the expression. Mm -hmm. Actually, I want to add to what Meister said. Um, it's, it's a lot like... Um, Bel canto music, I think, is a lot sort of like what Shakespeare is to theater in the sense that the actor brings um, their ideas of based on what the text is, and then they meet together with the director and they and they put on this production that is going to live and breathe in that moment with it with these actors that they have, and that's kind of what we do with Bel canto is that we um, in our preparation not only do we prepare the technique and the vocality and making our voice sound pretty la 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 <laughs> we also are really working on um, finding the right color for the right moment and so you might even have like three or four options for a, a very important moment of how you could do it that you that you come prepared to do in the event uh, basing it on what the production is going to be like what the stage director would like what the maestro asks of you um, and then, so that's how we kind of create this living, breathing, ideally, create a living and breathing uh, a show. So. I'd like to ask all four of the singers, and let's start with the guys. What's your favorite moment in this opera? I think that's a sort of interesting question since this is new to all of you. Um, what, what part of the opera, either in, in your role or in somebody else's role, strikes you as being just a, a favorite moment, a special moment for you? Well, I think that's very different if you want to know if which, uh, in general, which is the most beautiful moment, uh, or in the particular role we sing, uh, for instance. How about in your role? role? Well, of course, I, it's very easy to answer for me. When I uh, started rehearsals, and that was uh, during the performances of Tannhäuser, so we had the musical rehearsal uh, at one day, and I thought, Okay, when I heard the sopranos, the soprano and, and the mezzo, and, and uh, when I heard the ten, I said, okay, I'm definitely just a super in this opera. <laughs> <laughs> so my most favorite part in this opera is, of course, the big duet in the third act with uh, Maria, um, since there I can at least a little bit sing as well and, and show that I'm a soloist as well, not just an ensemble singer. <laughs> Okay. So in general, I have to think about. I cannot answer it right now, but I come back later. Okay. I wanted to add one line to things before, uh, which I talked before about uh, the bel canto singing. Um, 
it's really a pleasure to to develop a piece with uh, such an experienced maestro like Eduardo Müller, and that helps a lot. <laughs> yeah, Gisha, your first, your favorite moment in this. Okay, my piece. favorite moment is uh, I have a little aria in the duet with uh, Elizabeth, which is so beautiful. I'm uh, I'm singing this role. I'm pre I prepared like two months ago. Start to prepare it. And every time I'm singing this piece, it's, it's everything moves, and it's just so gorgeous. And the very last scene when I'm coming in, it's very big, dramatic singing. I, but that my dream was to be dramatic tenor, but I'm not, unfortunately. <laughs> and so I'm screaming that 10, 15 measures, and I'm enjoying it because it's so big singing and very dramatic. So. <laughs> because nobody will hire me for Otello. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Kate, your favorite moment in the opera? Um, I think the beginning of Act Three, for me, is my favorite. For my part, <laughs> um, is my favorite part. It's the moment uh, when she has the death warrant of Maria in front of her, and she's deciding whether or not to sign it. And it's we're, we're staging it that it's very, very late at night, early in the morning, when your mind is just spinning, and she's in that kind of what do I do, what do I do, what do I do, panic. And then the tenor comes in and, of course, throws everything off, and as tenors do. <laughs> <laughs> Angela? Uh, just because I've, I've had a lot of experience in um, ingenue type roles or, or um, suffering girl roles, um, <laughs> I really, really like the confrontation scene because, um, like he says, he's a frustrated dramatic tenor. I'm totally a frustrated mezzo, and, and my dream role would be Azzo Tenor. I really would like to sing that. <laughs> so um, <laughs> it's sort of the closest I'll ever get to it. And um, it's, it's just fantastic to have this uh, explosion that's absolutely eloquently presented. Um, and I wish that I had words like that when someone had really peed me off, you know? <laughs> <laughs> well, now you have them. Oh, yeah. you just, I'll use the same words. Yeah. Okay. Throw them out in Italian. They won't know. It's great. It's great. You see, um, everybody likes uh, his own part of what they are singing. I love uh, when I have plenty of people uh, on stage. Uh, there is a wonderful sextet uh, all in the piano. And after the piano, there is a kind of explosion for the finale of the first uh, act, uh, which is fantastic. So the, my favorite part is when I have uh, hundreds of people on stage and I have in my hands. <laughs> <laughs> Andrew, since you've been directing the piece, um, what's the moment that strikes you in the last couple of weeks of, of rehearsal that, that seems to be a moment that you're particularly proud of? That's a hard question because uh, there are so many moments uh, in the piece and also very many individual moments from the artists. Uh, and I mean, all of these singers contribute something very special to the roles they're playing. Um, you know, I, I, one day I would agree with Kate that it's, it's, it's the, the, the scene of the death warrant. Uh, the next day, I mean, it, it, one would be terribly moved by Angela and, and Reinhardt doing the, the, the confession scene. Um, another would be uh, the scene with Yegishe and, and Elizabeth. The, you know, the, Mary's final scene with the chorus would be another. Um, I mean, the chorus were remarkable the other night in what they did. So it's very difficult. I, I, I think when you love the opera greatly, you, you, you love it. Um, and it's just a matter of whether a scene is uh, more or less difficult for the stage director. Um, and I suppose for me, a scene, I, the scene I find most difficult is the, um, is the uh, duet for Mary and, and Lester in, in Act Two. Um, and that's simply because I got so deep into the historical background about it that, you know, I mean, it's, it's not there. And so I really have to work hard at convincing myself about that. But, you know, that, that's, that's where, where it is. And uh, it's one of the joys of this particular job that you can come to rehearsal and you can be so affected by different artists every day. You know, one, one's very lucky. One of the striking things about that uh, duet between Lester and, and Elizabeth uh, is the text, the libretto. Now, Schiller always 
did terrific research on his plays. I mean, the research available to him, the, the facts available to Schiller at the time may have been askew uh, or may have been wrong it, 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 in our revisionist you know, look back uh, at British history. But one of the things I think that he got right and therefore Bardari and Donizetti is that Elizabeth expresses in that, in that uh, duet how she feels that Maria is something of an enchantress like a sorceress with, uh, with men, and that she's able to turn people to her. I mean, according to my reading, Elizabeth really believed that about Mary, yeah. and it's one of the reasons that she stayed away from her. That, that was apparently true. And um, initially, uh, Elizabeth thought it would be a good idea to meet with Mary. And a, a meeting was sort of half arranged to take place at York, but her counselors were so against it that it never happened. And then, of course, as the years went by and Elizabeth heard more and more and more about Mary, um, she became nervous of, of, of meeting her in, in, in case she actually fell under this woman's spell or yeah. charm. Yeah. I think it's a, a fascinating aspect of their relationship that uh, you know, they could write each other and call each other sister you know, and have very a cordial relationship for the most part, for the most through, part. Their, through their letters. But things, but when things got a little too close to the British throne, which in some ways you had as much right to as she did, <laughs> you know, it was a little, it got a little dangerous, I think. Yes, I and mean, it's quite interesting when, when we're doing a scene and, and we, I'm talking about Elizabeth having the right to the throne and Angela just sort of, looks <laughs> rather quizzically and says, well, you know, I don't know about that. Um, and, and it's true. I mean, it, it does depend who you read. And, and also that, you know, Angela shouldn't actually think too much about Elizabeth because, I mean, that's not where she's coming from at all. And, you know, she firmly believes that what she's doing is right and, and what she's owed is right. You know, and she, and she was also, a, you know, a pawn in a political game, you know, and... Uh, yeah, it's, it's, it's very difficult for, for, for both of those women. And yes, I think the confrontation is a fantastic bit of theatrical license. But I also think the idea that these, these two women never actually met is also extraordinary. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Now I'm going to ask an absolutely silly question of the ladies. Um, is it fun to dress up as the queen? <laughs> Which queen? Yeah, I wanted You're to. You're both queens. Queen. <laughs> it's extremely different. Um, okay, well, <laughs> I'll start since I am the real queen. <laughs> um, we've only had costume fittings at this point, so we haven't actually done the, the full thing. But I have this, like a, like, a wheel that's around my waist, literally, that sticks straight out. So I've got this enormous sort of immensity of a, of a skirt. Um, in the costume fitting, they had all these different pieces with jewels dripping and peep, another overcoat thing with more <laughs> jewels and the wig and the jewels coming off of that and crowns and jewelry and jewels, jewels, jewels. Insanity. Um, but yes, it's very fun. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it's going to be a little uncomfortable, I'm sure. It's not like wearing pajamas or something, of course. But I mean, it's not supposed to be. It's supposed to keep you feeling, and it really does help for that character because when you're wearing something like that, you can't slouch and you can't frump around. Mm. I mean, you, you have to stay erect. So um, yeah, it's a blast. Why not? <laughs> hey. Angela, is, is your get up as, as uh, gaudy as that? I, I'm not a girly girl like that. I, really, I, I always want to wear jeans if I can. So um, usually I don't really care about my costumes. But Mary was extremely specific about how she appeared. And, and uh, w she actually believed that like part of her role as the Queen of Scotland, France, and England were, uh, <laughs> was to, to actually play to a crowd. They say she had this amazing common touch. And um, she was... Even at a wedding, she sort of created quite a scandal in France when she married Francis because she insisted upon wearing white, which was the color of mourning at the time. So um, she really kind of believed in dressing for drama. She was a very, very kind of um, dramatic person. So I've been really um, 
specific about how I wanted her to be seen, you know. And Andrew and I have a running fight about um, <laughs> one of my costumes because it's totally gorgeous and we cover it with a black cloak. And I kept saying, well, can I take the cloak off? Can I take the cloak off? And then finally, we did the whole scene and he was totally right. It actually worked better when I, when I really did take the cloak off, which is about 30 seconds towards the end. So. <laughs> Yeah, we won't tell you what it is because yeah, <laughs> no, yeah, that's the surprise. Right. Now, I know this isn't the Metropolitan Opera quiz, but I do have to ask you this question oh, and just see, see whether anyone knows. Who was Mary's roommate in France when she was growing up who was also an important operatic character? She, uh... <laughs> You conducted the opera. Anna Bolena. No, 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 no. Her roommate was Elizabeth, wasn't she? Who was? Yeah. Was yeah. Tell the, tell the. Uh, Am I right? Well, I, don't want to I think you're pretty name. close. Um, sh the, her roommate was Elizabeth, who married uh, the king of Spain. Philip II. Is it Philip Elizabeth II. of Valois? Yeah, Elizabeth of Valois. They grew ah, up. Carlo. They grew up almost as sisters. Yeah. Yeah. I didn't know that. Yeah. Another bit of Schiller, yeah. Uh, mm -hmm. <laughs> you yeah, learn something new every day. Good. I, uh, let's, let's end. I'd like to ask all of you, what's next for you in your career? Where are you going from here, Andrew? Uh, I go back to London to work at the Royal Opera House, and then I come back here, I'm very happy to say, uh, pretty quickly to do um, another staging of my Pearl Fishers production, which is, um, is a very wise investment that Ian Campbell made, because <laughs> it's going everywhere, which is, which is very nice indeed for, for all of us. Yeah. Maestro. It is the uh, next... Uh, Cavalleria e Pagliacci uh, here, uh, and then Seattle uh, Puritani, and then uh, Madama Butterfly in Cincinnati. I am uh, I have fifth month of uh, America tour uh, here. But I still have something to say, as always. <laughs> oh! <laughs> <laughs> this opera is very simple to conduct. Mm. Extremely simple. So simple that for this reason it is difficult. The difficulty is, uh, of course, uh, I must control the balance, uh, very important, but uh, I have experience enough to do that. Of course, uh, I must be flexible, uh, because uh, uh, in music, uh, two and two are five and not four. Mm. I have to be free in the fluency of, uh, of the phrase. But what is important, more than, what is difficult more than other, is to convince the orchestra that the piece uh, is uh, beautiful. Mm. Because uh, when they play in the reading for uh, two pages, um, da, di, da, um, da, di, da, um, uh, they think, oh, but uh, in the afternoon I have this lesson to do. <laughs> the difficult thing is to convince the orchestra that this is a masterpiece. Mm. And uh, we can do a lot to help uh, what the singers do, framing their beautiful phrases dressing their phrases, but we can also do a lot uh, ruining if we, we just think of something else, we, if we are not concentrated in what they are doing. So, it's funny, but uh, it is difficult because it is too easy. <laughs> Grazie. Reinhardt. Well, too easy would be if I just, after Maria's, would stay here making holiday and vacation <laughs> and singing Aida <laughs> after that, because those are about three and a half weeks be between those two productions. But Unfortunately, or fortunately, I don't know, I have to go back to Germany doing three performances of Freischütz, one magic flute, and then one performance of Lone Green in Spain, and then I come back. Oh, my ah. God. <laughs> oh. And, uh, and by the way, uh, you have to make a Google Earth trip to Reinhardt's little town in Germany, the name of which is, what is the name of the? The name is Felitz. It's V-I-E-L-I-T-Z. And this is a little town, little village north of Berlin, about uh, 40 miles north of Berlin, uh, with 260 people living there, directly on a, on at the a lake. Little, on a little lake, and it is beautiful even from Google Earth. It's absolutely gorgeous. Uh, right after this, I will go to Metropolitan Opera to cover Traviata Alfredo. Ah. Mm -hmm. Very good. Kate? I'm going to sing Orsini in Lucrezia Borgia in Torino. Wonderful. 
Angela. Um, I'm going to cover Lucia at San Francisco Opera. <gasps> oh, brava. Great. Well, thank you all very much for being here, and we look forward to Maria's today. Thank you. Thank you.